Depending on where your moral compass aligns, today's central figure could be regarded as a legendary figure of immense stature, or as the epitome of a despicable character. Born with the name Octaviana, he ascended to the position of bishop in his early years, etching his name into history as the most audacious pontiff Rome had ever witnessed. Preferring the gleam of swords and armor over the solemnity of religious regalia, he veered towards hunting escapades rather than devout masses. His inclination leaned more towards invasions than sanctified ceremonies. In the intricate web of alliances, he was not averse to siding with adversaries while plotting against those who were once allies. The crescendo of his tumultuous papacy was nothing short of dramatic. In an exit befitting his flamboyant persona, he left an indelible mark on history, both figuratively and literally. At the very least, this is one perspective on the matter. Join me on this journey as we delve into the annals of what could very well be the most catastrophic era in the history of the papacy. This, my friends, is the narrative of Octaviana, the son of Alberic, hailing from the esteemed lineage of the Counts of Tuscaloosa, more commonly remembered as Pope John XII. You slapped the wrong guy. In the tumultuous 10th century, around the 980s, the Italian peninsula stood as a complex tapestry of shifting powers. Though the portrayal here may seem simplified, I implore you to bear with the essence of the narrative. The northern expanse of the peninsula was under the rule of the Kingdom of Italy. Yet this title was more symbolic than substantial, for the true might rested in the hands of formidable feudal lords. In this backdrop, the crown of Italy bore a certain prestige and privileges, for the Italian kings had aspirations to shield the Pope under their wing and, in return, secure their own coronation as Holy Roman Emperors. Now onto the scene steps the father of our central figure, a man ensconced in the ranks of those very feudal lords. His name was Albrecht, and his lineage hailed from Spelito, a town standing 130 kilometers to the north of Rome. The year was 932, when Albrecht's mother, Marosia, embarked on her third marital union, this time with Hugh, the Marquis of Provence. This nobleman held a dual role, wearing the mantle of both King of Italy and aspiring Holy Roman Emperor. Their wedding unfolded in Rome, a city that Hugh ambitiously sought to claim as his dominion. However, the lofty designs of this foreign marquess foundered against the resentment of the local aristocracy. The Roman elites bristled at the notion of an outsider exerting control over their city, and they coalesced behind the banner of Albrecht, who became their torchbearer. Amidst this tense atmosphere, a fateful incident unfurled. Marosia, Albrecht's mother, requested the seemingly innocuous task of her son pouring water for Hugh's handwashing. Albrecht, harboring a sense of reluctance, carried out the request, a gesture that Hugh interpreted as a slight. A slap from Hugh's hand escalated into a heated clash between the two. In the wake of this altercation, news reached Albrecht that Hugh harbored intentions of retaliatory violence, planning to gouge his eyes. Seizing the moment, Albrecht embarked on his rebellion. Swiftly, the Italian nobleman marshaled the support of the Roman aristocracy and the populace, fomenting an uprising that succeeded in expelling Hugh from the Eternal City. This marked Albrecht's ascension as the de facto ruler of Rome, a role he held until his passing in August of 954. Before he departed this world, he compelled the Roman nobles to pledge their allegiance to his son, Octavianus, a young boy destined to become the next pope and ruler of Rome. Poor general, master schemer. Right from the inception of his reign, contemporaneous chronicles couldn't help but observe that John's disposition was ill-suited for the demands of his position. John's demeanor was impulsive, unrefined, and his moral compass was less directed towards matters of faith and more drawn to earthly pleasures. As the vibrant offspring of a feudal lord, his heart resonated with the thrill of the hunt, the pull of the bowstring, and he harbored a roster of mistresses. His appetite for conflict was not that of a medieval cavalier seeking random skirmishes. There was a calculated agenda at play, one that his father, Albrecht, had set in motion. Dating back to the times of Charlemagne, 
popes were entitled to the Patrimonium Petri, or the inheritance of Peter. This concept referred to prized territories flanking the ecclesiastical domains, extending both north and south. However, in the wake of the Frankish emperor's demise, these lands had slipped from papal control, seized by other lords. It was now Joan's turn to reclaim these dominions. Armed with resolve, the young pontiff unsheathed his sword and led his armies into what should have been a triumphant campaign. Yet, fate had other designs. His ambitious aspirations were met with disaster. John's voracious appetite for territorial gains proved to be his undoing. To the north, he engaged in a clash with the Exarchate of Ravenna, inadvertently provoking a confrontation with the new king of Italy, Berengarius I, and his son Adelbert. Simultaneously, he turned his sights on the Duchy of Capua to the south of Rome, only to suffer swift defeat on both fronts. His humiliation was compounded when Berengarius turned the tables, pillaging the ecclesiastical states in 960. Faced with dire circumstances, John sought allies with haste. Realizing his unpopularity among the Italian lords and the waning support of even the Roman aristocracy, he played his diplomatic carb astutely. With strategic finesse, he dispatched emissaries to the court of Otto I, the formidable Duke of Saxony and reigning King of East Francia. The proposal put forth was a military alliance, a proposition that Otto, with the irresistible prospect of ascending to the rank of Holy Roman Emperor, found impossible to decline. As fate would have it, Otto nursed his own grievances. Remember Hugh of Provence, the stepfather of Albrecht and former King of Italy, who had lost Rome after clashing with his stepson. That very figure, Hugh, passed away in 947, leaving the Italian throne to his son Lothar. Lothar's rule was tragically short-lived, his death soon following. Amidst the grief, his widow, Adelaide, found herself facing the usurpation of the Italian throne by Berengarius. In her desperation, she beseeched Otto for assistance, sweetening her plea with an offer of marriage. A Judas and a devil. From the depths of history, an account penned by a close associate of Luprand of Cremona illuminates the trial that laid bare the spectrum of accusations against Pope John XI. The pontiff stood accused of a litany of transgressions, from conducting mass without communion to flouting sacred prayer times. He ordained a deacon in an unconventional barn setting, appointed a ten-year-old bishop, and allegedly profited from selling bishopric positions. The accusations grew darker, spanning sacrilege, perjury, open weapon bearing, and hunting with a bow. He faced charges of adultery, incest, and even the brewing of diabolical love potions. The list extended further, grievous bodily harm and murder, including the alleged order to blind and ultimately kill his own godfather, a cardinal. Painted as a reveler, John XII was said to revel in drinking and gambling, invoking pagan deities before dice rolls. Churches languished under his reign, and his papal residence devolved into a brothel. However, contemporary historians cast a skeptical gaze upon these accounts. While sources affirm Joan's licentiousness, Lepran's loyalty to Otto might have tinged his portrayal. His account at the trial might be more exaggerated propaganda than a factual record. Despite Joan's defiance and excommunication of those involved in the council, the gathered bishops, pressured by Otto, rendered their verdict on December 4, 963. John XII was to be deposed, and a new pope would be chosen. The mantle fell on Leo, who held no priestly, let alone bishop or cardinal, titles. As the superintendent of Roman public schools for scribes, he found himself catapulted to powerful heights. On December 6, he assumed the name Leo VII, marking an abrupt ascent to the echelons of authority. Revenge of the Pope The saga of Octavian, once known as Pope John XII, continued with clandestine machinations even after his deposition. From his refuge in Tiboli, he plotted to ignite an anti-imperial uprising within Rome. Trusting in his remaining loyalists and the possibility of rallying public support, 
He aimed to overthrow Emperor Otto and Pope Leo. His agents, a network of former lovers, set the stage for an uprising on January 3, 964. But Otto's forces proved too formidable, and the revolt was swiftly crushed. However, amidst the chaos, Otto had failed to notice the brewing storm. John XLI had amassed a new army and positioned himself in Spoleto, north of Rome. As Otto marched north, the insurrection was reborn. Leo Veare fled as the imperial garrison faced defeat. By February, Octavian returned to Rome, reclaiming the papal throne. Seeking vengeance, he inflicted brutal punishments on bishops who had aligned with the emperor. Yet, the tide shifted on February 26, as another council nullified the decisions made in the previous November. Leo's election was overturned, and John XI was declared innocent of all charges. The reinstated pope awaited Otto's inevitable retaliation, but logistical challenges delayed the emperor's plans. When Otto finally prepared to march on Rome, news arrived that John XI had died on May 14, 964, in Naples. Accounts differed, one citing a stroke during intimate moments, another a fatal fall during a liaison. Thus ended the scandalous life of a pope who may have been the youngest and most infamous in history. John's legacy is resurrected as a cautionary tale of how temporal power and hypocrisy contain the spiritual mission of the Catholic Church. Though accusations against John include murder and devil worship, skepticism lingers, as these may have been exaggerated for propaganda. His political legacy, however, was significant. His scheming and military ambitions led to the issuance of the Optonian privilege, binding papal elections and autonomy to Holy Roman Emperors. His maneuvering fueled imperial interference in Italian affairs, setting a precedent for conflicts like the investiture controversy. It would be an oversimplification to label him solely as the instigator of European wars, leaving the ultimate verdict on whether he was the worst pope in history open to interpretation. Thanks for watching the video, and if you found it informative, please like and subscribe to Time Capsule for similar content. We look forward to sharing more knowledge with you in the future. Until then, take care.